So how do our kids know? How do we know when they go from being cute and everyone's loving on them to someone looking at them and seeing them as a threat? Hey, mamas. Welcome to the More Than a Mother podcast, where we believe you can pursue your dreams and be a great mother at the same time. I am your host, Lawan Moses, and I am helping you find the freedom to live. Are you ready? Let's go. Hey there. Welcome to another episode of the More Than a Mother podcast. This is your host, Lawan Moses, and I am back with you again. Today's episode is going to be a little different. And operating in transparency, I'm going to let you know ahead of time that there is no script. At times, it may feel like I'm rambling or ranting. You may hear me flub some words, and things may just happen. But I just had to use my platform, use my voice, just to speak on things that have been happening lately. Now, if you're like me, a content creator, you probably had your whole content calendar planned when you were going to release certain episodes or certain content, certain blog posts, things of that nature. But life is happening around us, around me, and I, for one, simply cannot ignore that. So my normally scheduled content has been put on hold because I felt it was so important just to use my platform, use my voice, just to speak with you all today. Now, if you're listening to this episode when it first airs, it's June 1st, 2020. And in the beginning of June 2020, right now in America, we are just in a time of chaos. That's really the best way I can describe it. I mean, a lot of systematic things that have been suppressed for so long have really become visible to all. And the fights that Black people in America have been fighting for are just really being seen and the injustices are being seen, the injustices are being seen and everything around us is really just coming to light. So as a Black woman in America, as a Black mother, a Black wife, that I have Black children, Black husband, Black parents, family, et cetera. I am at a point where I am tired. I guess that's the best way to describe it. And I am typically an optimistic, happy, go lucky person, pleasant demeanor, things of that nature. But even to the most optimistic person, things just tend to touch you and reach you in a different way. Now, over the past few weeks, we have just experienced seeing such cruelties deaths, murders happening to our black and brown men and women. And it's not even just the past few weeks and past few months. I mean, it's been happening, but now it's being filmed. And it's really opening the eyes of those who may have not seen it before and bringing to light how some people truly feel, how others are willing to see things in a different light and just kind of move forward and progress. But recently we saw tragic deaths of Ahmaud Aubrey, who was out jogging in his neighborhood, followed and shot and killed by white men. Then we saw, heard of, and didn't see it firsthand, but heard of Breonna Taylor, who was sleeping in her home and the police rushed in and she was killed in her own home. And most recently we've had George Floyd, the man who we all saw handcuffed down on the ground with the police officer with his knee on his neck, cutting off, I can't even describe it, but just holding him in that position until the life slipped out of his body while George screamed, I can't breathe. And the officer just had this look on his face of just pure Hatred. I mean, that's the best way I can describe it. Like there was a lack of compassion. He was kind of looking at the people filming him with just that smug kind of appearance of, well, what are you going to do about it? Like when I look at that picture, that's all that I think of. He's screaming and crying for help. And that officer is looking like, what are you going to do about it? Now, I must say here that 
as with anything, there are good and bad of everything. So just as many, there are bad cops, but there are so many wonderful officers, law enforcement, things of that nature. So this is not a bash law enforcement or anything like that. That is not the meaning of this because I myself am connected to law enforcement. I have lots of law enforcement friends, relatives, etc. But as with anything that we recognize and anything that we see, we know that there are good and bad. So there are good and bad leaders, law enforcement officers, advocates, business owners, things of that nature. And you gotta have to take the bad along with the good. But in these incidences, we can kind of stand up and say, enough is enough. I mean, I, for one, did not watch the video of George, but I did see the final outcome and I've seen still images. I started to watch the video, but in case you didn't know, social media and things of that nature can be a trauma. So I know my triggers, I know my limits, and when I started watching the video, I had to turn it off. This, everything's going on, I mean, it's traumatic. These are traumatic incidences. I mean, we went from starting the new year with the tragic deaths of Kobe and Gigi Bryant. Then we went into COVID-19 happening and everyone's live stopping and just everyone constantly on edge in fear Wonder what's going to happen with this virus, what's going to happen with their relatives, seeing relatives, family members, friends be sick, pass away, things of that nature. And now we've moved into the instances where our Black men and women are being murdered. It's being filmed. And even though it's filmed, nothing is being done about it. It's still happening. It's just that now we can see it. So we have had one trauma after another, after another. And if you know anything about trauma, that trauma can build up. It doesn't have to be direct to you. This is indirect trauma when we're constantly consuming it, constantly viewing it, constantly just seeing everything that's going on. That becomes a trauma. So at some point, you have to learn your triggers, learn your limits, and just know when to disconnect to protect your own mental health. But I came on here today, and I'm recording this episode on June 1st, 2020 just to speak of the plight of just Black people, Black mothers, just the weight of the world that is on our shoulders. It is really just a hard, difficult place to be in. And I mean, having conversations these days with our children, things we didn't usually have to kind of talk about. Because I know I'm just trying to think back to my childhood. I don't remember it being so outright. I mean, there was Rodney King, there were things of that nature. But now I guess with camera phones and things of that nature, cell phones, it's being broadcast more. But we're having to have conversations as Black people in America with our children that is almost reminiscent of probably conversations that our parents or even our grandparents had with their own parents as to what you need to do to stay safe as a Black person in America. But then it's also troubling because the advice that I may have been given by my parents or the advice that even a few years ago I could have gave to my son, who's now officially an adult, that advice has really gone out the door. Because, I mean, the things that we would usually say, if you comply, then you stay safe. If you do what you're supposed to, you stay safe. If you do the right things, you stay safe. We've always had to have these difficult conversations in Black homes about the things that we can and cannot do that our non-people of color may be able to get away with, we won't be able to get away with. I mean, these are conversations that have happened in our homes forever. But lately, the conversation has had to change. Because what can we really do at this point to stay safe? If we comply, we're murdered. We go out for exercise, minding our business, we're murdered. We sleep in our own home, we're murdered. Walking down the street every day, it's like a target on our back. And you'll have to excuse me if you hear me get emotional during this episode, because as I said, this is just real talk, real insight. And I like that I have this platform because I am big on diversity and inclusion 
And I have such a large, large and a wide range audience that my message can reach. So that is why I'm having this discussion. And if you hear the emotions, that's because this is really an emotional and trying time. But at this point, what can Black people do in America to stay safe? Our hands are really tied. And I think that is the biggest struggle now. How do we protect our families? How do we keep our kids safe? How do we keep ourselves safe? I mean, these are all questions that mothers in general ask. But being a Black mother in America... You ask, yourself, you're, you ask yourself this question on a whole different level. I can't tell my son who's driving that if he gets pulled over, that if he does everything right, then he'll be fine. Because who knows who that officer is that's pulling him over? I can just pray that it's a quote unquote good officer. But what if he encounters someone who isn't? He complies, or even my husband complies. It is such a scary time because you don't know what can happen. Even in my neighborhood, and I live in a fairly decent neighborhood, for the first time in forever, I was out walking my dogs at night and was anxious because you just don't know these days what is going to happen. I've lived in this neighborhood for a long time, but these are just the thoughts and things that start to plague my mind, plague our minds as the days go by. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how to stay safe. We don't know what we can tell our children to comfort them when they're crying to us because they're in pain, because they're seeing what happens, because they're not understanding. And I know all mothers can relate to the feeling of powerless, feeling powerless. No mom wants to feel powerless in her own home with her own children. We want to have the answers. We want to fix it. We want to be able to tell them everything will be okay. But we can't do that right now. We can educate them, give them the tools they need, but there's nothing that we can say at this moment that will help and guarantee our children's safety. Because somewhere along the lines, our children, specifically our black boys, go from being cute and handsome to a threat. Their mere presence makes someone feel threatened. Walking down the street, elevator, store, wherever they may be, in a car, just because they are a Black male in America, their presence frightens and terrifies people. So how do our kids know, how do we know, when they go from being cute and everyone's loving on them to someone looking at them and seeing them as a threat. I don't have that answer. I'm not sure if anyone has that answer. But these are just things that I would like us to just start thinking about. Now, there's been a lot online because, as we know, businesses are going online, lots of businesses being done online. And... In the business world, we're seeing true opinions of some top, I will call them influencers and white influencers in industries. We are seeing some garner support, some shut down conversations, and some just stay silent. And that's really a showing sign of how people feel on certain issues. Now, We appreciate all of our allies. And I say this every day on my social media because I love everybody. I mean, I really do. And if you know me, you know that I strive to do everything in love. 
And to me, this right now is really not about white versus black. It's about hate versus love, racism versus humanity. That's what it really boils down to. We are all human beings. We breathe and bleed the same way. The things that make you sick will make me sick. But yet, because of the color of skin, for the history of this country, Black people will forever be judged or have forever been judged, seen as a threat, viewed as less, given less, had to fight twice as hard to make it. And just speaking from being a teen mom who got pregnant as a teenager, and that speaks to my drive, being a young Black teen mom who was automatically typecast as one that would be poor, one that would be on in poverty, on the system for my entire life, never make it. Those are judgments that were cast upon me because I was young, I was a teenager, and I was becoming a mother. So that became part of my drive to make it to where I am today, to where I have a voice and where I have a platform, to where I can help reach back and speak and pull others up. And in my book, Rising Above Statistics, I talk about how those judgments happen, how I've had social workers tell me, well, what do you need to get an education for? And I speak to this in my book where I had one social worker like when I was young and I had my first son, I was going to have my um, second daughter. So my son was probably, he was about seven this time, yes, because they're seven years apart and I had just had my second child. So my oldest daughter, I just had her. And the whole time that I had been on social services receiving support, I had the best social worker ever, the best caseworker ever. And suddenly around the time of the birth of my daughter, things switched up with locations and I was assigned a different social worker. And when I tell you this woman gave me the hardest time in probably the three months that I was on support or receiving assistance with her, then I had in the whole seven years I had been on it with my son. I mean, she really did. Every time I completed one piece of paperwork, I had to complete another piece of paperwork. Everything I did, it was always like trying to prove that I needed this assistance. And I always take it back to one of my first conversations with her after I had my daughter. And I had to add my daughter onto my case. If you're familiar with social services, then you know that you have to add your children onto your case when you um, have a new child. And when I called, she asked me where I worked. And at the time I was working for the state. And also, I forget how school came up, but I told her I had just finished a bachelor's program. And now I was going into a master's program. And her words to me were, why are you still going to school? What do you need a master's degree for? The state only requires that you have a bachelor's. I have a bachelor's. And my response to her was, because that's something that I want to do for me. But as I reflected on that conversation after I hung up, it was just kind of her reflect, deflecting her opinion onto me saying, all I have is a bachelor's and I'm your caseworker. How dare you try to have a higher education than me? And from that point on, when I tell you, she made it just a living hell, I'll say that. Having me fill out form after form after form, forms that I had never seen in the whole seven years I had been on the system before. And then I reached my breaking point when she wanted me to take a form and give it to my neighbors just to verify certain things. And I thought to myself, why should I have to give this form to my neighbors? Why should they know that I'm receiving assistance? Why should they be privy to what's happening in my life? And it was at that moment that I cut ties with social services. And yes, that was hard because I didn't know where the support was going to come from for food, daycare, and everything at that time being my situation. But I mean, luckily, I always had a supportive family. But 
it is just moments like that that come back to mind when I think about where we are today. How dare we as Black people want to be educated? How dare we be leaders? How dare we be business owners? The nerve of us to better ourselves. I mean, that's really the attitude that's been around for a long time. It was unspoken until recently, but now it's showing itself through different angles. But anyway, I digress. That just came to me as I was sitting here just thinking and talking and processing this all through. But when we look in the business field, I just would like to speak to my non-people of color, my white influencers, those that have a platform where they can speak out and make a difference. There's nothing wrong with being an ally. I have lots of allies, as I will say, that are okay with taking a position, taking a stand, saying it's not okay. Those that recognize they have a privilege. And I mean, recognizing you have a privilege is not a bad thing. It does not make you a bad person. Just because you are privileged does not mean you are a bad person. It's just recognizing that because of the color of my skin, because of certain circumstances, because of certain things, I am privileged. That's what recognizing your privilege is. That does not mean you're a bad person. It just means that you recognize that I have an advantage over someone who may not have that same privilege. But the thing is, once you recognize your privilege, it's all about what you do with your privilege. And running from your privilege is not the answer. Trying to justify your privilege is not the answer. There's nothing wrong with owning your privilege. Own your privilege and then use your privilege to make a difference. If you don't like the way things are, start taking a stand. I mean, I have many friends that own their privilege. And I mean, they have racist family members and friends. And they will stand up to them because they want to see a different United States. They want to see different things happening. No one wants to live like this. I mean, there may be a certain subset of people that want to, but I would like to believe in the greater good that many are striving for equity. And it's not about equality, it's about equity. Many are striving for that one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, as we were all taught to say as kids. And one way to do that is to own your privilege and then use your privilege because, believe it or not, your voice will be heard louder than those that experience it. We as Black people can experience certain things all day long. We can say it's unfair. We can say it's not equitable. We can say we need systematic overhaul and things of that nature and solving racial injustice and things of that nature and having difficult conversations, but our voice will often go unheard. But it's when our allies step up that have the privilege and can start to educate each other, because I mean, it's really not our place to educate you. We need our allies to start educating others, helping their counterparts. That is how things can start to improve. And I will say this past weekend, I saw so many allies stepping up. So many saying, I recognize I have a privilege. I'm sorry this is happening to you. I want to do better. I want to know better. I recognize I don't know enough, but I want to know. I want to learn. I'm going to take the steps so that I can learn and understand what's going on so then I can do different. I want to build a diverse team. I want to do some diversity training because this George Floyd incident, Ahmaud Arbery, and all the other incidents that led up to this point really has shined a light on what has been happening in America for so long and has really made a lot of people check their privilege and realize This is what I haven't been seeing all this time. I don't like it because I know how I feel as a person. So now what can I do about it? 
So I encourage you just to own, if you're one of the privileged persons, just own it. Own it and then use it to help make a difference. You don't know where to start. You don't know what to do. I mean, there are some great books that you can read. Uh, One is called White Fragility. You can make donations to causes. You can start having conversations in your public platforms. Yes, those conversations may be uncomfortable. They may make you uncomfortable. They may be a little tense at times. But if you facilitate and moderate the conversations, you can keep the dialogue healthy and it doesn't have to be hateful and ignorant. There is a such thing as having healthy dialogue about race and things of that nature. But the problem is for too long in America, the subject of politics, the subject of race and other things have just been taboo. No one wants to have them in a public forum. No one wants to have them with someone outside of their race. So that's why we're in this constant turning wheel of systematic oppression, things not changing because we're not talking about it. And beyond not talking about it, we're not doing anything about it. Think about the things that Black mothers may experience. Think about the conversations we have to have in our households, the loads that we are carrying, the fears that we have. I mean, it doesn't even just have to be Black mothers. It can be any mother that has Black children because I recognize that there are white mothers, mixed mothers, all kinds of mothers that have Black children, biracial children, all people of color. And you don't, so you don't necessarily have to be a Black mother to be impacted by the things that are happening to our children and have those concerns. But overall, think about the conversations that we have to have in our households that you may not have to have. Do you have to worry when your child goes out that they may not come back? Do you have to worry about your child when they're out running in their neighborhood, when they're sleeping in their house, when they get confronted by the police or pulled over by the police? Most likely not. But I just want to encourage everyone today. We are in a tough time, but it's through tough times that change occurs. A lot is coming to light. A lot of allies are standing up. A lot of people are standing up. Yes, there's rioting. Yes, there's looting. But there are also many peaceful protests happening. But again, we deal with the media. And the media is biased, as we all know. So they will show a certain angle. They will show certain point of views and push out certain messages. And then if we talk about leadership in this country, there are certain messages that come. So it's important just for you to stay educated as a person. Read articles. Talk to people. Go beyond what mainstream media is showing you. And get to the story behind the story. Because oftentimes what you see on mainstream media is just part of the story that they want to sensationalize, the part they want to push to continue to make certain groups of people, Black people, look like animals. But there are plenty of people that are protesting peacefully. There are plenty of people that are joining together with law enforcement and having peaceful marches and coming together and having conversations making steps and making strides so they can start to make a difference. So see how you can become a part of those groups so that you can use your platform, your group, your audience, your podcast, your blog, your media outlet to start to have these difficult conversations, to bring these things to light. They have been buried for too long. And the more video recordings that we get, the more things that come to light, It's going to be seen more, viewed more, and it's really the time to start to make a difference. So my challenge today to all of my mothers that are listening, whether you're Black, whether you're White, Asian, European, Hispanic, whatever it may be, my challenge today to all mothers is to remember that motherhood is universal. We all carry a heavy load. Some of our loads are heavier than others. So if you see a mother out here that is different from you, one that may be angry right now, one that may be struggling, one that may be hurt and sad, 
it is okay to reach out to her and say, I may not understand what's going on, but I support you. And is there anything that I can do to help you? It may not be anything you can do to help, but the fact that you recognize and call light to the unfair actions that are happening, the injustice that is happening, the murders that are happening, the fact that you recognize that this is not right, this is not how it should be, you feel helpless and you want to do something, that means a lot. Because in my opinion, silence is acceptance. Censorship is acceptance. It may not be a conversation you usually have. It may not be a forum that you're used to, but there are always exceptions to the rules. And it is up to you right now, whatever platform you have, to find a way to open that dialogue and have those healthy conversations so that people can start to heal. People can start to understand. People can start to come together. Because in the end, we are all human beings. We breathe, we bleed the same. We just look different on the outside. But in the end, we are all human beings. This is about humanity, about unity, about love. That's what it boils down to. Love over hate. Humanity over racism. Equity over equality. So I ask you today, what are you going to do to help make a difference? Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, head over to LawanMoses.com. I love for us to stay in touch. Make sure you leave your email address so I can send you inspiration, tips, and the latest updates. Or if you prefer, text the word more, that's M-O-R-E, to 302-440-4632. We have some great things coming up and I don't want you to miss a thing. Thanks again. Make sure you subscribe and leave a review. Until next time, keep pressing because victory is yours.